Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Uh, this is Professor G. Uh, many of you said my previous videos didn't have a lot of personality, so I'm gonna work on that. Uh, you also asked for a walkthrough for the, the notebook. So I wanna try to walk through the notebook. Uh, it's a pretty exciting notebook. I spent some time on it. Uh, so first, uh, let me explain what we were trying to do here. So again, these notebooks are structured with video and uh, some demos you can kind of work through to make them a little bit more fun and interactive. Uh, the first notebook was okay. The future notebooks hopefully will, in fact, the one we're working on right now will have lots of really cool uh, 3D graphics to play with. But uh, let's first walk through this notebook and, and I'll try to explain what I wanted you to do with each of the, the little activities here. Uh, and then we'll have more of these walkthroughs uh, in the, the future uh, notebooks. All right, so let's get started. Uh, so as before, we, we import a bunch of things. We're going to import NumPy and Pandas. We always import NumPy and Pandas. Um, I really like the graphics in Plotly, so I'm going to use Plotly graphics so I can click on stuff and in the future make 3D pictures, but uh, we'll just import these for most of our, our notebooks. Maybe while I'm here, I'll point out a few things. Um, since I do like Plotly, uh, I use the, the Plotly offline mode for controlling graphics. Actually, I don't really typically use the PY interface much. Plotly Express is a really cool way to make a, a, a plot quickly. So px.scatter gives me a nice scatter plot. The defaults are pretty reasonable. Um, the Plotly graphics objects are this geo object, I, or this geo uh, module lets me create uh, individual kinds of plots. If I want a scatter plot and I want figures or I want to uh, control axes, I can do that with this geo. So it's kind of more low level, actually somewhat similar to the PLT, the matplotlib uh, plot interface. Um, Subplots I haven't used much, but I typically import it. Figure Factory is sort of like Seaborn for uh, Plotly. So it, it comes with a little more sophisticated uh, pre-canned plots. So Figure Factory has like a disk plot that looks just like the Seaborn disk plots. Um, Cufflinks uh, it, it essentially binds Plotly functionality to pandas. So if Cufflinks, you can uh, invoke a, a data frame dot I plot, just like before you'd say data frame dot plot, you now say iplot and it'll make a, a similar plot to what the data frame would have done in matplotlib, but now in interactive plotly graphics. And then uh, the cufflinks module, you, you can tell it to run offline. In the old days, plotly could actually uh, automatically share your plot online. Um, I think by default, these are, these are off anyways, but I, I go ahead and set them. And then you'll see in these notebooks, uh, I'm starting to use this ipython display uh, command to embed the YouTube videos. I haven't found a, a good way to put them in markdown. So this is, this is a bit easier for now. So we'll, we'll import that. All right, so I talked about the lecture format. I also wanna point out that I'm, I'm gonna to try to have a playlist that you can click here and just, if you don't wanna go through the notebook, you can watch the playlist one video at a time. Uh, perhaps maybe you're doing that at the gym or I, I don't know when you watch these videos, but yeah, now you can just, just go through the playlist and not have to go through the notebook. But go through the notebook. Okay, cool. Um, so I had a recap video. Uh, many of you hopefully skipped this. Uh, I, I wish I had too, uh, but that's just you know setting up where we were. I'll try to have recaps of each of these notebooks to kind of get people uh, up to speed. Perhaps you've forgotten what was in the previous notebook or where we were. Uh, the recap will help you get back to there. Um, oh, the other thing is I'm going to try to have questions throughout notebooks to like you know, get you to think a little bit about what I just said. Uh, this was a sort of silly question, but I'll have you know occasionally recap questions. And what I'm going to try to do is put the answer here. So you think about it for a second, and then you click on the answer, and it shows up. All right. So uh, this was a, a bit longer video discussing the, the multilinear regression setting, uh, trying to set up the problem. There's multiple different kinds of notation used when talking about regression. Um, every semester I change the notation and it's confusing for me, um, but I tried to find some notation that's somewhat consistent with what I would see in textbooks or other papers that you might read in the future if you wanna uh, build on, on your, your knowledge of linear models. Um, I also use the Diamonds data set. This is one of the kind of pretty standard data sets that people use for regression. Uh, it's a, you know, I actually forget where it was collected from. Uh, it's a fairly large number of uh, diamonds I think were sold on, on a online retailer's website. It has the price and various characteristics of those diamonds. And it's again, good to demonstrate or you know, useful for demonstrating feature engineering and regression. All right. Um, I tried to give a little bit of context about that and I walked through some of the, the structure in the model that we were considering and ultimately we're, we're gonna build out a model which has some, uh, some intercept term and a couple slope terms for each of these features. 
And the, the features here, uh, when I say feature, I'm referring to like, typically a, a column in my original table. Um, these are things that I might have about a diamond that I'm trying to estimate its price for. So I, I might not know how much this diamond is, is worth, but I might be able to measure its carat, its depth, and its table, and ultimately want to build a model that would let me know the price from that information. All right. Uh, there were some typos in this notebook. I think I fixed a few of them. Uh, if you find errors in these notebooks, let me know, and I can try to update them. The hope is that people can use these in the future, as le at least as study materials, when we get back to a regular uh, you know, in-lecture style class. All right, so uh, first set of interesting commands. So I, I go ahead and pull out the, the N and D. So N is the number of rows. Uh, it's pretty standard notation to use N to be the number of records, the number of rows in your data set. D is the number of columns. And again, pretty standard notation to, to treat uh, columns as D. Uh, a bit of a joke in statistics. I, I've often seen P correspond to parameters. Um, actually, maybe in this class we'll use both. D can be the, you know, the columns in my matrix. It's possible I might have more parameters in my model than I have columns, uh, but D for dimension, P for parameters, they, they often get used interchangeably. So in the notebook we talked, or sorry, in the, the lecture we talked about adding a ones column to each of our, our uh, tables. Uh, th this is a um, it's kind of a hack, and in a subsequent notebook I'll talk a bit more about why we do this or why we might not do this. Um, but the idea is that if we add a one, an extra column of ones to our data, then we, we don't have to have an extra intercept or an extra constant term. It just becomes a slope on this extra ones column. Um, and so the, the mathematics for writing down the model becomes a little bit more compact. So uh, in actually, I think in the notebook we released, I didn't have a function here, so I've upgraded this notebook slightly. And so I've added a add ones column. It's going to use this uh, horizontal stack operation in NumPy to take essentially a column vector of ones and attach it to the left uh, of a table. So I'll go ahead and, and run this function or load it. And then I can add columns to my data frame. Uh, so here I'm going to take my data frame, pull out just the caret, depth, and table columns from that data frame. I'm going to convert that to a NumPy matrix. And then by invoking add columns, I'll add an extra one. So you'll see right here, add one's column. It's been add a column of ones has been added up to my, my matrix. And so X is a matrix. You can see that because it has a, it's an, a, a list of lists, if you will, though technically really an array of arrays. All right. Um, some of you have asked about my use of this funny at character. This is a, a new feature in, I think, Python 3.6. Um, and this allows, uh, this is an extra operator that the, the NumPy library can then override. Um, and it's been defined as the matrix multiply operator. So my linear model is just my uh, X transpose times uh, theta. Um, if I just do star instead, that's not that will not actually work. So star will try to do an element-wise multiply, so it'll just multiply each of the, the corresponding elements together, and I'll get back a vector. What I really want is a scalar, right? So I want to compute the dot. Um, I could have also written xt dot theta. This would also be okay. In fact, I'll, I'll go ahead and leave that there. Um, that will do the same thing as the at symbol, but this is a little bit harder to read. Uh, maybe it's actually not so bad here, but if I had done something like, I'll just write it here, if I wanted to say a dot, or I'll write a at b at c at d, um, that's a little bit easier to read than uh, the corresponding a dot b dot c dot d, right? Um, so, so the at symbol, this uh, binary operator, is easier to read. All right, so that's my linear model. Uh, I don't know if before I seeded it, but let's go ahead and seed a uh, random number generator so that whenever you run this notebook, you get the same result. I'm going to make a guess for theta by just picking some random numbers from a Gaussian. So this is going to draw d plus 1 random numbers from a Gaussian. It will be a Gaussian with zero mean and unit variance. Uh, d plus 1 because I have to draw a parameter for my uh, intercept. So this is just going to be a random guess at theta. It is truly a random guess. Um, and now I can take my linear model for this random guess of parameters and make a prediction. And I've made a prediction for the uh, third row, or the uh, x subscript by 2. So computer scientists start at 0, so this is the third row. Um, and that is the price of the third diamond. Um, out of curiosity, what was the caret of that diamond? 
x2 colon uh, 0.23 carats. I have no clue if that's an appropriate price for a 0.23 carat diamond, but I can figure that out by actually looking up what the actual price for that diamond was, and that is, oh, well, I haven't defined y yet. Um, but we have our data, so we can go back to our data. If I want to get the, the uh, second row, I will do iloc2. Uh, there we go. There we go. Carrot 0.23. Good color. Uh, and the price was 327. Well, I got a little bit lucky. That's at least a positive number. It could have been negative. Uh, so I guessed 136 with my random model. Um, and the true price of that diamond was 327. All right. Uh, so now we can take... Uh, our linear model is defined up above, and because I wrote it, let's go back up here. <laughs> because I've assumed I'm taking my data such that each row, not column, each row um, corresponds to a, a record, then whatever I, uh, if this has many rows, if this was a matrix, not a single record, um, then I don't need to do a transpose, uh, and I can just directly dot with my theta, right? So that means that if I pass in my x to this model, uh, it will now make a prediction, uh, a y hat, for each of the values in my, my matrix x. Cool. All right. Uh, just to match the notation in lecture, I could have, instead of using my cool function, I could just say x uh, matrix multiply by my theta guess. Uh, that is my y hat, and it is the same thing. I guess to really make that point. I ran it again. Oh, well, I will save my y hats. Um, so I've made two versions of the prediction. They're identical. Uh, one is calling the function I created, which basically does the same thing. Here is exactly what I wrote in lecture. All right. So then we, we had a bit of a video on minimizing loss. This is a little, a little bit longer and talks a bit up about the geometry. Um, this is where the normal equation uh, comes from. I guess I didn't mention that in, in this video lecture, uh, but th this Normal equation is called the normal equation because we're looking for the, the vector that is normal to this surface, that is perpendicular uh, to the subspace uh, spanned by the column vectors of our data matrix X. Um, oh, I should also add that the data matrix, I call it a data matrix, it's also sometimes called the covariate matrix. All right, so I, I then walk through a bit of the least squares loss uh, re-derivation here, uh, just to, to refresh your minds of, of what we computed. Uh, it, unfortunately, in, in this version of the class, we're not working through the calculus, so it sort of ends here. This is a, a, at least giving you an idea of how you'd write the least squares loss in matrix notation. Um, for those of you who are interested in matrix calculus, you could then try to take the derivative of this loss function and solve for theta. Um, and you'll see that you know, setting the derivative equal to zero, solving for theta, will in fact uh, produce the same result as the derivation via the normal equations, or the normal equation. All right. Uh, let's see. So uh, I wanted to evaluate the loss. So we're going to now actually get our y vector. So I'm going, or, or yeah, our y vector. I'm going to take the price column um, from my data matrix and convert it to NumPy. Um, and so I get a, it's technically actually a matrix. Uh, which is a column vector, right? So it, it be more, it's a bit confusing. Uh, so let me actually do the following. So if I just do uh, price instead of the extra brackets and then convert that to NumPy, I get a one-dimensional array. So this will be, um, an, in fact, we can actually look at that. What is the shape of this y dot shape? Right, so it only has one dimension to it. Um, and so this isn't going to work as a, a column vector. Um, so when I uh, select multiple, when I say I want to essentially to return a data frame now, um, now when I convert it to a NumPy array, it is actually an a n by one instead of a one, just an n dimensional or uh, a size n uh, array. So if I look at the shape now, it's going to be n by one. Uh, so five, 53,940 by one. Um, and we want that so that the uh, dimensions all work out in our matrix operations. All right, so uh, the squared loss we've seen before, and I'm just rewriting it as we've written it before. So this would be my, my observed value, the, the actual price of the diamond, and here's my uh, predicted value for the price of diamond. Um, notice I'm just using the, the matrix multiply. 
I'm squaring each of the terms in this column vector when it's done, and I'm taking the mean of that column vector. Uh, and so if I do that and I take the loss, I get a, uh, a loss for my guess at theta. Um, we can also write the same uh, uh, matrix notation above. So we go back here, I want to do uh, y minus x theta uh, transpose uh, times y minus x theta. So writing that down here, I get y minus x uh, times theta transpose. So dot t is the transpose operation uh, times y minus uh, x theta. Uh, take all of that, and I actually call this item function. What is that doing? Well, actually, let's see. So if I pull this out, actually, I will comment this away. If I run just that, sorry, minus the, let's pull all of this out, which as I said before, I'll comment it out. Okay, so if I run this, what do I get? So if I don't say item, uh, even though this uh, sequence of matrix operation produces a scalar, um, NumPy is actually going to report that as a one by one matrix. Um, and so I just want the value of that one by one matrix. So I take item um, and then we need to divide by n. So that's y shape zero. This is the n. Uh, and now we get something here. Um, and it is about the same. It's actually slightly different due to variation in numerical precision. Um, I'm actually not sure which one of these is going to be more accurate. Uh, typically, linear algebra libraries, which this would be using, are going to optimize to preserve some numerical precision. Uh, so I might bet that this is slightly more accurate, um, but the difference is kind of in this last uh, you know, set of digits. Uh, and we are taking sums of squares of fairly large quantities, so we'd expect some variation in numerical precision. Okay, so we calculated loss. The remaining step was to minimize the loss. So uh, I actually already derived the minimization of loss. I put a, a, a short video here trying to reason about the matrix dimensions because I typically find that helpful when, when thinking about um, the, the, normal, the solution to the normal equations. Uh, in particular, I guess the, the highlights being that this, the thing we're inverting ends up being much smaller than the original n in our data. All right, so how to actually do it. So we're going to use the inverse function first from the uh, linear algebra library in NumPy. Um, and then we can take the equation we have right here and uh, in some sense pretty beautifully directly translate that into Python code. So what does that look like? So I'm going to take x transpose times x, so x transpose times x, inverse, and then multiply that by x transpose times y. Uh, notice we could put parentheses here, it's not necessary. Uh, the, the at operations make this pretty, uh, the, the at makes this easier to read. Um, just to, to give you a point of comparison, I guess we could have also written this dot this, but nobody can read that. So uh, we won't do that, we'll leave it as uh, this is a much more compact version. Okay, so we took the inverse and multiplied and we've computed the solution uh, to the uh, normal equation. We've minimized the loss and we didn't need to do a complex iterative, iterative gradient descent procedure. We had a closed form solution. And that, that is one of the cool things about uh, these linear models and this the least squares loss. Now, in practice, you don't typically use the inverse operation to solve this problem, in part because first you do an inverse and then you do this matrix multiply uh, and you can actually do that more efficiently because that's essentially asking to solve a linear system. So we can instead use the solve function from the, the uh, NumPy linear algebra library. Uh, and that looks like the following. I pass in, um, well, let me back up. Uh, so the way this is working is I'm trying to solve a function that looks like this. Um, so I have a, a matrix A, which is going to be a set of constants. I have a vector theta that I want to solve for its values. You can think of this, you know, theta one, theta zero through theta n, um, or sorry, theta d. Uh, and then I'm, I'm trying to, uh, you know, solve that for a, a constant vector b. Um, maybe if you've taken a linear algebra class, it's typically written a little x equals b, and we're solving for the, the variable x. But in, in our class, x corresponds to data. It's not a variable. Uh, at least not yet. All right, so I call the solve function. I need to give it my A matrix and my B vector, and it will figure out what the theta should be, and it will produce the exact same result. 
Um, this problem is pretty well conditioned. If we had ill-conditioned problems, solve can also be a little bit more robust. All right, so we're almost there. So we've solved for our, our theta hat. We can now make predictions with our theta hat um, by simply taking x times theta hat. This is no longer a random guess. This is supposed to be much better. Um, and now we're left with how good is our guess. Um, in the original post of this lecture, I, I had uh, run the squared loss uh, on y hat, but that's not super meaningful. So instead, I, I want to just focus on the uh, visualizations for a diagnostic. Um, one of the things we can do with lower dimensional, with, with uh, small D data sets, when we only have a few columns, is you might actually plot the residual against each of those columns. So we do that. We can plot the residual against caret. This is probably the most interesting of these plots. And let's take a look at what we see. Um, I've had to make the opacity uh, less than one, so you get a bit of blurring to see that there's kind of a large amount of data here. This is not the most ideal way to visualize this data. Um, it's also going to put a little bit of a load on the browser since all of this data is being rendered in my browser presently. Um, but uh, it does let us see a pattern. And so we'd like to see our data essentially lying along the zero line. Um, and it's, you know, it's, I guess, here staying along the zero line, but we see it tapering off down here. Um, and so that's kind of a sign that uh, our, our model, so our y hat, uh, is larger than the true y value. Uh, so this is our line. Here's the true y value. So it's overestimating the price of diamonds that have large caret values. And that's probably because diamonds that have large caret values and also good cuts um, tend to be very expensive. So caret would be a pretty good indicator of price. Um, but very large diamonds may not have that same indication. All right, so this is something we have to deal with. Uh, we'll, we'll address that in a future lecture. All right, so that's not a great residual, but uh, again, might be able to address it. Uh, let's look at the other ones. Okay, so this is a little bit better behaved. Things are fairly aligned here. There isn't a whole lot of um, structure. We're not seeing like a, a deviation that's you know sloping off of this the zero line. Um, the data is pretty clustered around a particular depth. Um, so we probably have a lot of data, like I guess a lot of diamonds have this particular depth value. Uh, there's a bit of a bump here. So maybe you want to, to break this data apart. Uh, I, I don't see any you know, particular structure I would chase in this uh, plot right now. All right, one more, uh, the table size. Uh, again, I think we fit this pretty well. Notice there's some banding here, which would suggest that there uh, are sizes that are, are fairly, uh, let's say, 56, uh, 57. So integer sizes are more common. Um, it might be worth exploring this data a bit further because of this banding. Again, I don't see any big structural patterns with this, um, with this data. All right. Typically, one of the more reliable ways to diagnose a regression model is really to plot the prediction um, against the true value. Uh, and so we can do this no matter how many dimensions our x is because we're ignoring x altogether. Um, and so we're looking if they're for, for something that, that lies along the diagonal. Um, so we'd like to see is all of our data sitting along this diagonal, which would imply that y hat equals y. That means our model's a, you know, a perfect fit. Um, but we're actually not seeing that. We're seeing it uh, peeling off the diagonal as we go to the right. And that really means that as our y values are getting larger, as the cost of diamond is getting larger, our estimates are actually underestimating that cost. And so they're underestimating it probably because the costs are going up not because of something like caret, but because of other properties that we're not yet modeling. And so in future lectures, we'll try to address the cut, color, and clarity, um, and hopefully be able to bring this data back onto this line. OK, so that's it. Uh, I've hopefully made this notebook a little bit more fun by, by reading through it. Um, I will, in the short while, post another notebook that goes through the same kind of process but using scikit-learn uh, to give you a little bit more understanding of how to fit these models using more contemporary packages because in practice you probably wouldn't be using the linear algebra techniques anyways.